So I would like to talk about the intersection of digital desires and a kind of material culture. Um, so to state the obvious, I suppose, buildings are made of parts, and those parts have to come together in some way. And I think we've seen you know, really amazing examples over the last two days um, about how architects do that. So I want to talk about it relative to our practice, as well as what I've been doing with teaching. Um, so essentially, I mean, we look to the environment, and we look to art and architecture practice as sources of conceptual inspiration. But really, it narrows down to a few themes, which I, I think ultimately are quite traditional in nature. Um, one of them has to do with the relationship of surface, structure, and skin, um, where cells might aggregate, for example, becoming both an exterior surface and an interior structure. Um, the relationship of abstraction and figuration. That upper image is a picture of a snowflake, so I think we all know what a snowflake looks like, um, but its material structure reveals something quite different. Um, using ordinary or found elements in other ways that yield new uh, visual or sensuous possibilities. And then kind of the uh, elements of the everyday and how they might come together both for functional and performative use. So about um, 10 years ago, I started at Berkeley. And for about four years, I taught um, a course on digital fabrication, basically. And it, and it was through the experience of teaching that class that led me to um, write the book, Digital Fabrications. And I think, you know, we were looking at people like Shop, and we were looking at people like Office Dot, um, and students were building one-to-one -one scaled installations. And I think what we did over the course of the four years is we wanted to conceive of different ways that we could use this equipment where we weren't maybe doing sectional um, lamination anymore, but perhaps more complex um, line figures or figuration of lines over surfaces, for example. But um, ultimately, I, I got a little bit tired, I would say, with my own pedagogy um, for the class. I, I don't feel like it's reached its limits. I mean, there's so many possibilities of what can be made, obviously. But for me, I wasn't quite sure where it was um, going. And that is when I chose to work on the book, as well as do other work in practice. But what I came back to um, is the notion of structure. So we had worked with a structural engineer who told me that um, geometry is the single most important factor that de determines structural performance. And I probably should have known that because I have a background in structural engineering. Um, but I was not a very good structural engineer, even though I worked as one and actually worked on very large buildings. I'm not going to tell you what they are <laughs> in case you plan to visit um, once at Disney World. But, um, but basically, um, you know, there's, there's a very strong relationship between the shape of something and how it behaves. These are uh, clastic and anti-clastic surfaces um, with uh, different kinds of Gaussian curvature, but basically all of these are structurally optimal um, conditions. And, you know, throughout history we've seen examples of the way architects have leveraged um, these kind of geometries to make great spans. Um, it goes back centuries, and then also goes back to, you know, earlier of the last century, middle of last century, where um, architects and engineers were examining ways of optimizing structure in a sense. So you have um, the thin shell concrete or the geodesic dome um, and things of that nature, the high parse surfaces. And um, so these are things that were interesting to me. At the same time, I think, you know, we're not really there anymore because if we were, we would. Everything, everything would have to fall into one of these predetermined figures. And if we cared about the weight of things, we would all be living in geodesic domes, which maybe Buckminster Fuller wanted, but fortunately for us, never came to pass. I mean, I think where we are now is, is quite different, which is there's a kind of hybridization of a material, um, material acting as a compensatory device, in a sense, for structural feats. And so I'm showing one of Barco Leibniger's projects up here, the gatehouse, that has a, a gradient a density of its truss structure in order to um, achieve this really long cantilever, for example, or the CCTV project by OMA, um, where the surface structural diagrid gives way to um, a kind of fractal pattern, in a sense, where it becomes denser and tighter where one would imagine it would need to be, which would be at the uh, you know, intersection of the cantilever, and disappears entirely at other um, instances. Um, and then, you know, the, the Smithsonian by Foster, for example, which is a very pure structure in the sense that it, it's a pure grid and plan, and yet um, it's quite deformed in section. I mean, structure likes to be 
load paths like to fall into symmetrical lines, which none of these do. But in this case, case there's an integrated um, kind of HVAC and structural swelling um, at the columns. And so what I propose to uh, my students, and I want to start first by talking about the student work, because I think it's more, um, because it's pedagogical, it's more clearly defined, I guess, than in our own work at the moment. But in any case, this, the question that I pose to them is, OK, well, what happens when you take a structural typology, which is, of course, based on geometry, and that becomes deformed for you know, kind of architectural desires, um, and perhaps program and, and other things that we care about, and that merges with um, a, a material system? And how can these two things kind of become synthesized together? So students work on um, uh, geometric hybrids, I guess, where they might work with a, a high parse surface, for example, but they intersect or unite in less obvious ways. Um, that one being high par vaults, this one being um, groin vaults and uh, barrel vaults. And those two you know, things that happened at different centuries, in fact, in time, um, come together to form a new kind of hypostyle hall. Um, maybe where one could be above uh, and below. So I, I did taught this as a studio, but what I'm going to show is the work that I did in the seminar, which is taking this, um, these ideas, and the students do this kind of work too, and moving it into one-to-one -one scaled installations um, as a kind of structural and material experiment. So the students work in teams. I mean, it's a seminar, so we only meet once a week. Um, it's not super intensive, but they do manage to build things by the end of the semester, and they begin, again, with looking at a typology. Um, this typology was a diamond vault, which uh, you know happened in the Czech Republic as a very isolated kind of um, a vaulting technique, but yet quite um, you know beautiful and poignant in its own way. And, it, and really, a lot of it happened. What the students discovered is a lot of it happened in plan. But basically, they would take these and then look at permutations of them across um, a, a module first, um, and then across a surface. And then we would we run those surfaces through a finite element analysis software, not really for the actual loading conditions, because um, it's not a class about structures, per se. It's not about optimization, really. It's about the synthesis. So, But more to get an intuitive idea about how these um, things would work. And then they combine that with a material study as well. So they're making physical models of the things that they're modeling. Um, and trying to un understand you know, where it's red, it would have to be deeper or thicker, for example. The section um, would need to change. And so through the kind of investigation of sets of materials, those things come together um, towards the end of the semester. And so this particular group did make a, a vault of sorts, although it's a vault that has quite subtle um, differences where it's, it's more or less a triangulated structure, but actually not totally a triangulated structure because it didn't need to be. The lines of force didn't have to be so continuous um, all the way from the top to the bottom. And, and the other thing that we do in the class is we use very ordinary materials. So this is just paper, um, but it's through the development of it in section that allows it to span a distance. You can see how fat, in a sense, is getting. And then the, the subtle variation in the triangulation or diamond pattern. And then from above, I think the thing that I particularly like about this project actually is that the, um, the basic structural um, premise, which is triangulation, gives way into um, the way this, the topography of the top changes, and, and that triangulation becomes a, a, another kind of surface um, entirely. So uh, another group, for example, looked at folded plate structures. And um, of course, the deeper the fold, the longer it could cantilever or span. And so basically trying to understand how that would behave and how, you know, the different widths associated with it, where porosity could happen based upon um, the stresses, the internal stresses of the project, as well as gauging material, you know, what the material could do. Um, and then adapting to kind of localized site conditions as well. Like this one is sitting on a little wall and then and it has to fold over um, to the piece of grass. And then, of course, you know, the, the perceptual performance of the, of the project is as important as well. And here's some of the you know, kind of details, I suppose, at, the, at its base. Um, and then the last student project I'm going to show is one that looked at minimal surface. 
And a minimal surface, you know, this, is, this would be called the freeform minimal surface, meaning that it has a rigid top and then everything else would just hang. It would be under zero stress. Um, and so here, they're, they're, um, they're, the uh, invention was that it wouldn't be hanging at all, but in fact be bearing on this kind of lower point. Um, and so they developed a module that could, uh, it's actually just one module, but it could take on different um, forms and figures based on the amount of load, based on the amount of compression that it was under. And so through the finite element analysis, they were able to study you know, the, the different ways that it would behave and, and begin to predict, in a sense, um, what the form would be of the, of the final structure. And so this just is kind of a schematic describing, uh, you know, like heavier at the bottom, more weight at the bottom, less weight at the top, and then very thin, basically just back to its original plate um, where it was uh, in tension. Uh, just some descriptions of the module. And then the way that the module changes based on, um, again, the forces put against the two sides. And it's a really simple thing. It's actually just made out of a single strip, um, and that strip is folded together with a little bit of um, scoring in there, so that when you push on it, the scoring breaks, um, and it forms a solid module from the, from the open one. Um, so we were talking at lunch a little about low tech, and I would say this is pretty much the low, lowest tech connection that you can get. But um, you know, we, we do strive also to use what's at hand for us. Um, and so what's at hand here is rubber bands um, and just notches um, in those little pieces of paper to be able to bring them together. And then the uh, final structure, which I think you can see here did deform, um, which was not predicted at all, um, but, but which we were not necessarily unhappy about either. And then I think it's a little bit easier to see the gradient, um, the structural gradient in a sense, or the gradient of that surface based on structure um, in the shadow. So in our own work, um, you know, we do a range of projects, and I want to just show a few of these projects. Um, I'm not even going to show all of these projects, but just a, a sampling of them, um, because we deal with multiple scales, and some of those scales are the same scales that the students are working in. Those are the installation scale projects, and um, other scales have to do with build, you know, building scales. I'm going to show an interior, and then others, uh, larger scale projects that at the moment remain unbuilt but are kind of speculative. Um, investigations for us. And we've been using, um, for the installation scale project, we've been using this material, which is basically a wood veneer. It's not quite this material. It's this material, but it's backed with the paper, so it's able to be folded. And we've used that in a number of projects, um, just seeing how um, the number of ways that we can um, sort of experiment with it, in a sense. Um, the first project um, was is an operable screen. And really, because I had been teaching the courses in digital fabrication prior to this, one of the things that became very apparent to me was that um, the forms that we were making ultimately became really, really fixed. Um, and we wanted to kind of challenge that and to develop uh, internal tensions in the module itself so the module has its own kind of structuration to it. Um, and that would be able to deform um, when laced together um, and pressed upon any single area so that you know, kind of you press on one area that its um, deformity would translate to the adjacent neighbors and change the shape of the curtain uh, as a whole. Um, and so, you know, we, so we looked at sort of, you know, the flexibility of this kind of material. We also looked at the structural ability of this kind of material, learning from um, that last project by folding the pieces together, but in this case, being um, far more concerned about structural rigidity um, and, uh, you know, and being able to support the weight of a person, for example, who is, uh, whose body shape is inscribed there in the center, but also looking at that relationship of figuration, maybe something which is much more akin to the human body in the interior, but um, more abstracted at the exterior. And then we also looked at it um, in relationship to light and detail, just how to make a rigid edge, but how to also um, capitalize on the luminosity of that wood veneer. Um, and uh, this is a lobby that we did in San Francisco, but basically we're testing here the translation of this material from the ceiling to the wall. So it's behaving in two very different ways. How can something solid also be something which is quite light um, and take on a, a, a different kind of reading, I suppose, in this space? 
And then these, all these ideas, the idea about luminosity, the idea about folding and structure, um, came together in the project we did for the SciArt Gallery, um, which is Voussoir Cloud. So essentially here, the, um, the investigations that I've been doing with students and thinking about how structure and form go together with material um, came after we had done this project in the office. And so here again, you know, we're looking at the <coughs> translucency and the transparency of the thing. Um, but we're also looking at its structural potential as a really thin and lightweight medium. Um, what we chose to do is to fold along a curved seam, and that curved seam allowed us bearing, bearing at the points. So because it was curved, you know, the pieces could nest against one another. Um, I think we've seen this throughout the, the two days, but one of the most challenging things we find in our office is to be able to translate the material to the digital. So how can you take physical behavior and let the computer understand that. So here, when you score along a curved seam, the module dishes in section, which means it shrinks in plan. And so there's a three-dimensional action happening. And we needed to be able to manage that, basically, and be able to write a script that the, that the, com that the computer could understand. When you, fold, you know when you fold something in, in digitally, it doesn't recognize the stretching of material. So it doesn't really recognize material behavior. And so our challenge is really going through a, a process um, to um, instantiate that, in a sense, in our script. So this is our successful version, and we had a lot of unsuccessful versions. But basically, we knew that if we had it working in a flat plane, then we had calculated correctly th this curvature to the sectional curvature and that it would still form a pure, you know, we could understand the surface that it was ultimately going to make. The other models you see here were just simple handmade models that we made um, that were kind of doing their own thing. So we just picked some random pattern, you know, um, one's more regular than the other, but essentially picked some random pattern, put it together, and um, let it, you know, just kind of let it take on this vaulted form. So that vaulted form, in fact, became the form of the project. It's not something we really predicted a priori, but it was something more that um, emerged out of our material research. This shows one vault unfolded and some of the geometries associated with the curvature of the, of the module. So again, our overall plan dimensions were very different from, from the modules themselves because they were all shrinking at, at different rates um, when they were folded. Um, and then they are, um, at this point, the, pro the project really became one about packing. You know, how do you pack together um, all these things, and this is again where the structure kind of came into play. So we had an idea about porosity, um, and that the vault could also be porous, um, and the module can recognize its neighbors. The script is designed so the module can recognize its neighbors. So if there's a neighbor there, it will have a flat edge. If there's not a neighbor there, it has a curved edge. Um, so three voids around it gives you know kind of this more um, bulbous form in a sense. Um, and so basically, what's described below is is an ideogram of um, the way that the script works, which is it has a certain tessellation pattern. We give it a voided, um, you know, some kind of voided um, armature, uh, and then the module recognizes where it is in the position to the hole and forms itself. And then the script unfolds those pieces uh, for laser cutting. And of course, when you're working with something like wood, which is a natural material, it, it behaves in the way it behaves. I mean, no matter how micro thin you get a piece of wood, it still has a grain. And that grain wants to bend in certain ways and not in others. And so the other thing that our script had to do was to recognize um, how to place the modules on the sheet so that um, the, the vertical grain went along the longest uh, vertical edge. And then from there, really, I mean, you know, it was, it's kind of a parallel um, investigation. One was a material side, the other one was a, a formal side, a formal side having to do with the structure. Um, uh, we knew that the material was taking this vaulted form, and we wanted, and so we chose to work with vaults, um, kind of pack the gallery with them. That showed, you know, kind of a really preliminary study, and this one a little bit down the road. Um, but basically, it became a set of 14 vaults, which relied also on three of the existing walls, or two of the existing walls and an existing soffit, in order to support itself. And then we had a kind of larger um, spatial idea um, about how to kind of cascade back in a sense from that existing soffit um, in space and so that there was a bit of compression as one moved through. And it was probably at that point, and I want to say we had been working on the project for, because I think when you present things in a lecture, it seems like it's so linear, you know, the design process is so linear and streamlined. Really, we probably had um, 15 different schemes um, before we landed on this one. Um, so we had been working on the project for 
maybe two and a half months by this point. And it was only here that really the conceptual, um, the conceptual intents of the project became clear. And that was um, a structural one. So it was about how to take these kind of really pure structural paradigms, the one of pure compression and the one of pure tension, and to fold them together so that that chain would, so basically you would take that diagram and flip it upside down. So the chain is the thing, the really porous lightweight thing, um, the thing that has holes in it is the thing that's being able to span really far out of a super lightweight material. And of course we looked at previous masters like Fray Otto or, or Antonio Gaudi who did his ha uh, hanging chain models um, for Sagrada Familia. Um, and, it, and we were working together with Bureau Happold too who um, did a basically digital hanging chain models, you know, really similar, almost identical to um, the Gaudi ones, except that they were able to calculate stresses and lengths and get a lot of information um, from this piece. And then they were able to load it and figure out where the stresses were going to accumulate. And I think it, you know, I think we intuitively know that stresses are going to accumulate more towards the edges and towards the bases of these columns. And so um, this is in fact what does happen. Um, the material, while it had some structural properties of its own because it was really thin wood, um, didn't have very much. And so we really had to limit the amount of stresses we had too. So the process for us became one of a back and forth with Burrow Happold, just you know, really subtle repositioning of where those columns come down has a dramatic impact on the kind of loading um, that, the, that, the, um, that the surfaces have. So uh, there's two surfaces there. One is in the gray and one is in the pink. And um, we would give them the gray one and they would come back with a pink one. And that went back and forth a couple times because some of our spans are too long and things like that. But basically, even between the pink and the gray, which are so similar, really, they were able to change um, and reduce the stresses, the internal stresses of the surfaces by half. Um, and without that, it, you know, it just really would not have been um, possible. So given our, our new lines, our new lines of structure, we developed um, the surface, uh, the, the tessellation, the porosity, and then ran the script to instantiate the different pieces. Um, and this became our kind of one and only assembly drawing, which is really not about um, form at all. It was just about, it wasn't even about geometry. It was really just about an order, a sequence of things where the pink stuff happened first and then the you know, darker and then the lighter and so on. Um, and then you know, we, we kind of followed that and also followed our own common sense about how to build it, which meant that we would you know, work from the exterior surfaces first, kind of moving back into space, and then finally closing in um, the tops of the vaults. And so the gallery, I mean, I think every, you know, we also had an architectural agenda for, for the project, which is that it would have a very different character from above, um, because it could be viewed from this catwalk as, as from within. Um, and so trying to capture the light and the light quality of um, the clear story lighting that's, that's in the gallery. And here you're able to see the scale um, as well, but also the, the reduction of scale um, towards the back, the kind of ping-ponging um, of the vault lines through space. And then, you know, because the material is so dependent upon light, the way it's, it's, it reads, um, sometimes the, mo the modules really do look like these heavy blocks, um, where we really saw them as much thinner, almost like flower-like petals. That curvature is, is not at all dependent upon um, compression. It's really just dependent on the curvature in plan. Um, but basically, you know, it has this also internal dimpled effect, which we enjoyed. And you can also see the relationship of the grain. Um, so sometimes a project feels like a vault. You know, it's blocks. And other times it feels light and um, more, we hope, more ethereal um, in nature. And changes pretty dramatically um, throughout the day based on uh, the light quality from behind. So we're not always able to make our own modules, <laughs> obviously to make buildings. And, and we haven't done a lot of buildings. We're trying to move into that more now. Um, and the buildings we have are, you know, someone just calls you up and wants to do a hallway. And you know, we're, we, we take that, we will take that job. Um, <laughs> and uh, you know, so, but I, I guess the point of it is really that you know, where, and this actually leads to a house that we did too, but I'm not even gonna show the house, but really what I wanted to show was that, you know, we take really ordinary stuff. This is just wood siding. We just try to leverage it somehow for some kind of perceptual, or in that case, perspectival effect. Or in our project for Ordos, um, you know, thinking about the brick. Um, I love the project that uh, Mijin showed 
um, as well. And we wanted to examine corbeling and the kind of pinching together um, of certain surfaces around the courtyard and, and the way that that courtyard leaked out to the exterior surface. Um, what I'd like to talk about in a little more detail is our project for um, the Obscura Digital Headquarters, which is probably the most extreme in this sense because it was the lowest budget project, um, even more than that hallway. Um, and um, this is where our offices are currently too. So this is sort of a classic San Francisco story, which is that um, there were two high, these two guys who were high school dropouts. One guy was in a rock band, and the other guy's family made geodesic domes. And the guy who was in the rock band um, also tinkered around with um, projection. So, so I don't know, they were having drinks one night and decided, um, you know, I can project and you make domes, so why don't we project on the inside of domes? And it became this you know, entire business of not just projecting on domes, but really mapping onto any three-dimensional surface. This is at the Sydney Opera House, which we did for YouTube. I mean, the, the list of projects is quite amazing, uh, like the Guggenheim, and you know, it, it keeps going. Um, but they do it both you know, in an exterior way and in an interior way. And they were um, formerly in, in like these two warehouses, pretty big warehouses, South of Market in San Francisco. <laughs> Um, and they painted the warehouses black, and they painted all the windows black, and there was no light inside, and they all walked around in black. Um, they all had tattoos and everything, and then they got kicked out of that building, um, and they got this one, uh, which was quite different. I mean, it's still pretty, I mean, I think anyone would look at this and think, yeah, this is a pretty raw industrial space, and yet they felt like it was way too finished. Um, and so our challenge was trying to bring this to the garage level, and yet, let them mature also as a company. So the company had been, was about 10 years old. And, um, you know, like, the first thing we did is they brought in their feng shui expert, another, like, really San Francisco thing. So we met with the feng shui expert, and we sat down with him, and basically he said, um, you know, this is like the garage band getting the record deal. And, you know, how do you not ruin the second album, the sophomore album, or, or whenever it is that you do that album? Um, and so, uh, and, you know, being like a garage band, the budget was also really tight. Um, the budget started at uh, 50 cents a square foot, um, which we managed to, by the end of the project, which included a $150,000 sprinkler system, it was still only about $18 a square foot, which is really little. Um, but basically, our strategy was to consolidate the effort architecturally to the second level. So those three images of above are the lower level, the middle level, and the upper level of the space. And really, the main effort had to do with cutting a big hole in the floor, to allow for more interaction between what became their prototyping and showroom area downstairs, and then um, the production floor, which is uh, the second floor. Uh, so this is a big hole in the floor, and there's the geodesic dome. The, the other reason to have the hole in the floor, obviously, is they have a 30-foot diameter geodesic dome in there that um, is kind of the centerpiece of the showroom, uh, and it had to stick up through. Um, and then we built the conference room, which overlooks the showroom and a stair, communication stair down, uh, and a series of offices in the space. So basically the idea is, and everything else is pretty much just existing. That's existing carpet. Um, that's existing um, steel truss work. Um, so the building had been retrofitted maybe in the 1980s for the seismic um, conditions of, the, of San Francisco. It's a concrete, you know, originally a concrete frame building. Um, and so the conference room essentially shrink wraps around the um, seismic bracing, which gives you that little cut there. And that also allows for the stair to come down. So the clients would come in, um, go into the conference room, and then enter the stairway um, down to the showroom below. Um, all that material for the rail, well, not the uprights, but all the rest of it is also repurposed. It was on the site um, in these other kind of Western style um, handrails. Um, <laughs> uh, and then a view of the conference room, and you'll you see a little bit of the showroom below. Um, and then we used really simple greenhouse material, polygal. I think it's you know, not unknown to architects at all. Um, we just wanted to use it in a slightly different way, just exposed metal stud, and they're twisted so that um, the doors are able to kind of emerge out of them. Um, so the last thing we wanted to was have you know, kind of a series of office doors, which to them especially felt very corporate in nature. So you kind of were able to slip into the offices along the edge. And, and then the conference room um, is where we have, you know, like, one piece, which is very simple, uh, digitally, a CNC routed, which for acoustical ceiling tile. So um, the entire uh, room is lined with uh, black stained um, bamboo, 
Um, and then the ceiling is routed so that with a layer of fabric behind, and that actually forms a pretty effective um, acoustical barrier. So then from this conference room, you kind of look out over the showroom. And what you're, so you're looking down over the showroom, but you're also looking out across the space. And across the space is where our, our offices are. Um, we also happen to have the only operable windows in the entire building. It's a 36,000 square foot building. Um, so uh, we needed to keep a kind of openness between us, and we wanted an openness, openness anyway, and we've collaborated on projects since, since this. Um, but we also wanted some separation. We wanted to have a bit of our own identity. So what we did is we built um, a screen wall which uh, hangs from the existing structure. So while it looks like it's floor supported, it's actually floor pin, but um, hung. Uh, and then the, then the lower geometry responds to the dome, which is kind of immediately in front of it. So this is our office um, without the wall, and this is our office now with the wall um, in space. And what we, what we hope to create is some visual privacy between us, because people are in that conference room all day, and they tend to look out that window. Um, we didn't want to just be like, you know, in a fishbowl. So when you look straight on, the, um, the wall is, is quite opaque. But from an angle, it has um, the ventilation, you know, allows the air to go through and also becomes a storage wall for us. And then the angles of those, um, you know, of the fins themselves are based on the sun angles as they come in the window because we had previously been in an office and we like ruined all of our books. All the spines got faded and so this was our attempt to avoid that by kind of tucking them in deeper into the space. Um, and then we, we kind of got involved back um, 2006. We were asked by the Vitra Design Museum to do um, a house for the future. And then because of that, we were asked to do a city for the future. And then because of that, we were asked to do um, you know, a, a potential new high rise in this downtown neighborhood of Manhattan. And the things that we wanted to investigate um, with all of them had very much to do with the things that we had already been investigating with the installation project, which is what is the potential of the surface really? What is the integrated potential of the structure, of the mechanical, potentially in this case, of, um, you know, of enclosure? Um, how can these things be synthesized into uh, the surface? And so for the jellyfish house, it really became a strategy about um, a, structural, um, a structural network that also became an infrastructural network. Um, for the Busan Opera House competition that we did, it, it became a very uh, similar kind of conversation. Um, one about you know, a, a, a structural skin and wrapper but that also could let in light. This particular project, because it had three really concrete programs of um, you know, like the Black Box Theater, the Opera House and the Convention Center, um, the diagram became one more of a kind of trefoil um, where the circulation would wrap these three individual pieces. Um, so this shows how the light would come down through the project, but basically um, through a set of skylights that are um, connected adjacent to those programs. They become wrapped with the kind of concourse level of the um, opera house, uh, and then stairs traveling up to small courtyards that inhabit the roof. Um, and then, you know, on the opposite side of the voided space is the solid space, essentially, which is that of the program. So the program, you know, acts not only as, you know, essential for the function of the building, but also as a structure, the structuration of the project. Um, so the, the program becomes a feat, in a sense, that supports that concourse level. Um, and the structure kind of wraps from those feet up and around the exterior skin. Um, so the depth of the skin is reflected, reflective of um, somewhat of the loading capacity as well as of the, uh, you know, the shading for the interior. So just some views, you know, um, moving in through uh, and around that kind of circulation concourse um, and up to the roof terrace. And then um, the last project I'm going to show is the one that we were asked by the Downtown Alliance of New York to conceive of a tower for um, a new place that they wanted to kind of name, a new neighborhood essentially in Manhattan called Greenwich South. And it's, it, you know, it's there, but it's, it's a little bit ill-defined. Uh, it's, it's caught between the World Trade Center site and Battery Park. Um, and they, and it's, 
and it's, in, it's uh, infrastructurally cut off from the city. Uh, the urban network is kind of messed up. So the thing that they wanted to do was to open up this urban network. Um, and our particular site um, happened across one of the primary east-west connections that they wanted to create, as well as adjacent to you know, the predominant north-south. Um, and this project was vision study. The vision study was done by Architecture Research Office in New York. And they had invited about 12 different architects and landscape architects um, to work on the project. And the piece that they asked us to do um, was that tower. So zooming out from the site, one of the things that we realized is, you know, it is, it is um, on axis with Fifth Avenue in the distance, and Fifth Avenue is visible from the upper levels of this building. And it's also a, a kind of endpoint to the Brooklyn Battery Tunnel as it swerves into the city and then goes um, east. Um, so we wanted to take those different um, axes, essentially, and think about how to merge them together in the body of the tower itself. And so for this project, it was a, it was a relatively simple script that looked at ways in which the, um, the tower would first be extruded um, from the site around that east-west, new east-west street, um, be uh, twisted so that it ha had a north-south dimension up at the top, you know, to, to align with the Fifth Avenue corridor, um, get, um, you know, determining that rotation and where it happened. Of course, there were many permutations to, to try to, um, you know, aesthetically essentially determine how that could work best. Um, pinched together for cross-communication and structure, of course, for the tower, so that there was, you know, a, a solid ring, essentially, uh, between the two pieces. Um, and then the whole thing would be sheared off by the zoning envelope of the site. And that essentially formed the, you know, the, the way the tower looked. Um, we did a lot of permutations. And again, I think that the way what, you know, that we chose to decide on this is what not only worked the best, but to, but to us, would also look the best. And what, we, and what we felt could be realizable um, in some senses, even though this was not meant to be built um, imminently. But basically, um, the final form has a kind of internal structure as well, um, based on those you know, inner surfaces that are twisted together that um, brings light, could bring light down from the top to the base. And so we had done a bunch of projects in the office that um, I didn't show, but they, had to, they were fiber optic projects. And one of the ones was a, a kind of little model that we made, um, just trying to figure out, you know, well, what, what do you do with a, with a big office floor plate? And how do you bring light down in through it? And could something as simple as fiber optic strand, which is used anyway, um, be revealed and become an, an element uh, for design? And so basically, um, that is what we plan for this kind of internal um, space for the building. And then the skin, um, we imagine to be a structural diagrid. Um, that would be responsive not only to the loading conditions, but also to potentially solar angles. And so this was just a little study that we had done, and it was a fairly fast project. Um, it was about um, seven, eight weeks, I think, start to finish. Um, but basically, looking at those solar angles, as well as um, where, where the forces lay through the building as a whole, um, which would affect the depth um, of that diagrid structure. And then the building changes quite a bit as you move around it, mainly because you know it's, it's the two pieces. Um, so it's not really one tower; it's more like two inhabiting one site. Uh, and just understanding some of the changes um, that happen throughout the skin, where it needs to get more solid, clearly towards the base, and then the arc that um, responds to the Brooklyn Battery Tunnel at the base. And then, even though it was a pretty fast project. Um, we, we wanted to have some, you know, we, want, we, want, we wanted to have some viability to it, um, and so we thought, you know, how to nest, in a sense, the um, circulation cords of the building, and then uh, woven through those circulation cords would be the, the light-emitting um, fiber optic, and also these kind of internal lungs, which we imagine to be um, a kind of terrarium, oops, like a terrarium atrium, um, traveling through the floor plates as well. So a fire hazard in the making, <laughs> um, looking up through that central atrium, and then down across some of the terrarium floors. And then lastly, in the site, um, they suggested that the building be as tall as the Freedom Tower. Um, so we obliged. Um, and then just kind of, it's really different 
identity, I suppose, from, uh, you know, from the other side. And then lastly, the corridor along um, the East-West Avenue. Okay, thank you.